doing my part. So we're going to have to, uh, I should explain this quickly. I have this idea, and we'll see if you guys know what it has to do with this class. If we have some response curve that's kind of like this, does anyone know what that has to do with this class? Yeah? No, that's, my, that's going to be my teaching skills. Because this is the first time I'm doing this course and have the online course, so some days I'm going to try too hard and try to do too much, and some days I might do too little, but my hope is that I find a nice baseline pretty quick. So the other day, I intended to get through a lot more than we actually got through, which is why I bring this up. So today I'm going to try to go a bit faster. I don't think I'll dance around like a coordinate frame too much today. So where we left off, we were talking about um, this idea of tensors, and we just learned about index notation, or we're reviewing index notation if you'd seen it before. So just starting back where we were, uh, just to refresh some of the ideas that we talked about, and then a couple things I didn't have time to say that I wanted to. So first things first, a dummy index. Uh, could someone just shout out what a dummy index represents? Right, it's a summation, and we sum over the values of that index. So if the index ranges from 1 to 3 because it's three-dimensional, then we would sum three components. So again, using this guy as an example, the dummy index is which index? K. Okay. And then we have this idea of the free indices. So this is one thing I didn't say very clearly that I need to say clearly. When you have a free index, a nice way to identify that index one, it shows up once, whereas a dummy index shows up twice per term. And then the other thing with a free index is it's going to appear on both sides of the equal sign in an equation like we have here. So that's how we can identify a free index. So obviously in this example for number one, i and j would be the free indices. They appear on both sides of that equation. k, as you've already identified, is the dummy index. So let's pretend that this ranges from one to two. Then I would end up with t... Um, I, J, I could write this as A, I, 1, A, J, 1, plus A, I, 2, A, J, 2. And then if I ask you, you know, what is the component T, 1, 1, you could put the 1 and the I and the 1 and the J, and you would have your expression. If we had some values for that, you could then calculate real quickly, you make a computer do this very quickly, uh, what that component is. Another idea that we had was that this, the number of indices we used to represent the components of these mathematical objects was related to the order, the rank tensor of that object. So as a quick example, uh, B, I, J, K there in that second problem, what rank would that be then? Third rank, great. So something I didn't mention, uh, and I didn't have it in any of these examples, is that this idea of the number of indices, uh, the dummy index or the free index, that obviously extends to the numerator and the denominator of a term. So we will actually see lots of things maybe that can be like this. Um, so again, if this ranged over 1 to 2, so what is our free index in this case? I. And what is our uh, dummy index? Okay, so this might equal to, say, di. So I say di, I know it's the ith component of this vector d. I know it's a vector because it's got one index, so it's a first order tensor. So this is the ith component. I know it's the ith component because i is the free index. It needs to appear on both sides of the equation. So this can keep me consistent. Uh, you, you might come across sometimes and you need to rename these indices because you start getting a lot of them. So these are the things to keep in mind about the free index. I could easily call this uh, K and that would change this, uh, it would not change this at all. I've just renamed that free index. So we want to keep that in mind and one place we're really going to see this coming up very shortly is when you have the divergence, right? So this, all these ideas extend into calculus as we'll see. So, you know, the divergence of a vector is this guy. We write it this way in vector notation. If we write this out, you would have du1, dx1, plus du2, dx2. 
so forth. So if it's two dimensional, we'll stop here. So obviously, if we just look at the indices, we're doing the summing game again, right? So a quick way to write this might just be dui dxi. And then now we've already gone to index notation. We're well on our way to writing complex expressions like we're going to see when we get to strain. So that's kind of where I wanted to pick up today, just a quick summary about what we were talking about the other day, because now we're going to take this stuff and we're going to look at things that we're familiar with, which is all of the vector algebra. Uh, we're going to get to vector algebra, I should say, scalar multiplication, uh, cross products, all of those things that we know about. But we're going to, you know, get to see some of this, how this applies to those equations that we know in vector format. And we'll have a review. Yes? Just a quick question to clarify. Um, you taking the dummy indices out to two in that problem you just did there. Yeah. Is it just based on context, how many dimensions we're dealing with? Yeah, that would be. And also just based on time that I didn't want to write out the third one. I, if I was something like this and I said, oh, just do this in two dimensions, I would tell you that, you know, I and J or whatever the three indices, I'd tell you their range. Um, or the dummy indices, all of them. So this is where I left off. We got to here. Uh, special tensors. And they're special, as we'll see, we see them all the time in mechanics. They're very useful. They help us manipulate expressions. Um, there's also special features about these tensors that we'll discuss more once we've learned a bit more about tensors and we do some tensor analysis. The first thing is the Kronecker delta. So you've probably seen this in a math class, I bet, somewhere along the line. Let me see if I can get out to this live journal thing. So I also just put this stuff on the D2L website today, just about an hour ago before I came over here. I realized I hadn't put it on yet, so I'll try to be more consistent with that. So it's on there, for, you know, at least a day after a lecture, and then I'm going to try to get my lecture slides on before, so you could follow along, hopefully, if everything goes well. So let's start with the Kronecker delta. This guy, that's my delta. It looks kind of like a fancy S. So this has very, very useful properties. Um, Mainly this, that the Kronecker delta is equal to zero when i is not equal to j. So if we start plugging numbers in here, that would be some scenario like delta 1, 2. i is not equal to j, that would be equal to zero. Delta 3, 3 would be equal to 1 because i is equal to j. And it's equal to 1 if i is equal to j. So one of the nice things about the Kronecker delta is it kind of helps us avoid some ambiguity. So I wrote something out quickly the other day, and I didn't really give it a thorough explanation. I think I wrote like four terms and gave them all the exact same indice right after I talked about how dummy indices only had two indices in a term. So I kind of thought it was a lame example myself. Um, but one way that this might come up, actually, if we were doing a dot product, and so I showed you that we could write, if we have u dot v, I said, you know, we could just write this, obviously. And then I said that this is equivalent to ui vi. Well, where the power of the Kronecker delta actually comes up, so I've written this just out in components. But if we wanted to really write this out, um, the vector u is ui ei, where ei is its basis vector. So if we wrote this out and expanded it, this would be kind of the whole expression. And v, we could write as vi ei. So now if I want to write this dot product out, I might have something like this. Well, that's a problem. Because now I do have four I's. So this would be like our first example of when it would be appropriate to rename a set of dummy indices, because it's only allowed to appear twice per term. That's our convention. We better stick to it. So what you would do here is you would change, say I would change the I's for the V term, that vector, to J's. I need two of them, because it's still summed if I wrote out this whole vector term. So now if we do this, uh, you know, ui and vj, those are just scalar multiples. Those are real numbers here. So I can really pull them out of the dot product. So I could have ui, vj, and then ei, 
EJ? Well, we know that this is actually, we know what this is equal to. We know that it, this is equal to UI VI. So this is where this comes in. This is actually equal to the Kronecker delta. So we have the basis EI, that component dotted with some basis EJ, and that's equal to the Kronecker delta. And why is that? Well, what we have here, if this is our basis, those guys are orthogonal to each other, right? So if I have you know, a mismatch of I and J, if I had E1 and E2, and I did the dot product of these, it would be zero because they're orthogonal. And if they were in the same direction, so I had E1 and E1, and I dot those, I'm going to get one because these are uh, unit vectors. They're orthonormal. So that's how we get the Kronecker delta here. So this term, UI VJ delta IJ, is equal to UI VI. So this is what the Kronecker delta is really good at, what we use it for most of the time. So now you see I have the dummy indices I and I and I, or I have J and J. So what the Kronecker delta actually does is it replaces an index. So I have this J, or I have I. I can look at this either way. I'll go with J. So I have these two indices. So they contract on each other, as we're going to talk about in just a moment. And what happens is this is equal to VI. So it just replaces the index. So I can go from VJ to VI. And then we have this term UI, VI. And that's primarily what we're going to use the Kronecker delta for. Um, one other nice property of it that you might already be aware of is that if we write this out, so you can represent the components of a second order tensor. There's two indices. This is a lot like a matrix. So we're used to representing indices or matrices with indices. We talk about their components is where they are, row and column. So we can also represent the components of a second order tensor the same way. So I you could think of as the row, J you could think of as the column. So if we go through this, what we just learned about the Kronecker delta uh, in matrix form, if we represent this this way. So what's 1, 1, the first entry, first row, first column? 1, 1, 2, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So it looks a lot like the identity matrix, which is really handy. That's a special feature about the Kronecker delta. Uh, it's invariant itself. It's the only second order invariant tensor. So no matter how we would try to rotate this tensor, it would always have these components because it's just the identity matrix. But I'm a bit ahead of myself right now. Uh, the next special tensor that we're going to use quite a bit is called the permutation tensor. And it's given by try to write this a bit better, permutation tensor is given by uh, epsilon sub ijk. So first of all, from what we learned, what order tensor is this guy? The third order tensor, it's very good. So it has special properties too, just like the Kronecker delta, and we're going to see today how this becomes very useful when we try to do our vector algebra in terms of index notation. So the properties for this guy are that it's equal to 1 when i, j, k are clockwise permutations. So what does that really mean? What's a clockwise permutation? Permutation is a combination of the numbers that these can have, non-repeating. So if i, j, k run through 1, 2, 3, respectively, uh, clockwise permutations, we'd look for things like this, 1, 2, 3, uh, 2, 3, 1, and then 3, 1, 2. And the reason they call it clockwise, if we drew a clock and we had 1, 2, 3, if we go clockwise, so no matter where we start, it's that order that the next number would be on the clock. So that's an easy way to remember that. So when we're dealing with this object, this tensor, whenever we actually end up putting numbers into these indices during a calculation, we always look to see what the order is, because it matters. So if it's a clockwise permutation, it's equal to 1. Uh, if it's anti-clockwise, it's equal to negative 1. 
So what that would mean is if we see something like this, I'll try to connect this here for the notes. These would basically be whenever it's out of order, according to this clockwise notation. So, you know, we might have 1, 3, 2, or we might have 2, 1, 3, or we might have, what would the other one be, 3, one, three. 2, 1. Two, one so, if we see these kind of anti-clockwise permutations, then this guy is equal to negative 1. And for any other case, it's equal to 0. So, that would be whenever you have repeating indices here. So, if we have like 1, 1, 3, that's equal to 0. Uh, 2, 2, 1, that's equal to 0 always. So any other case, this is equal to 0. And just like I showed you with that dot product, where if you plug in your actual expression for the vector, again, the actual expression for a vector u is it's equal to this. So if we wrote this out, we would have u1, e1, plus u2, e2, plus u3, e3 with respect to some Cartesian basis. So we saw when we plug that into the dot product expression, we found that this expression for the Kronecker delta. We found that we could always have the Kronecker delta if we have ei dot ej for the basis vectors. So that was kind of handy to know uh, because we learned that we could replace indices basically with the Kronecker delta. So this guy has something special going on with it as well. Uh, if we think about what's going on here, uh, first I'll start here. We have these special properties, so we're gonna. This is where we'll start. Okay, um, certain properties that are useful. So I'll call this properties of use. Uh, the first one, because of this permutation idea, so e i j k is going to be equal to E, J, K, I is equal to E, K, I, J. So I gave you an example where I plugged in numbers like 1, 2, 3, um, 3, 1, 2, or 3, 2, 1, what was it? 3, 1, uh, yeah, 3, 1, 2. Well, that extends also if we just flip those orders so that they cycle uh, clockwise. So this is all, those are all equivalent. So you could start replacing expressions, as we'll see, and this would be equivalent. So if I had E, I, J, K in something, I could also just stick in E, J, K, I, and this may help us out with some derivations later on that you might have to do in homework. So this idea is sort of important. But this is also going to be equal to, just from this expression up here, any of these terms would be equal to these anti-clockwise permutations. So now let's think about cross products and what happens with the cross product. So if we just look at our basis set, uh, it's E1, E2, E3. We start here. So we know that if we take E1 cross E2, we get we get a vector that's perpendicular to E1 and E2 on that plane, so we get E3. We should all know these things. Um, and that if we switch the order, if we do E2 cross E1, we get negative E3. So just right there, if we think about this idea of permutations, I've got 1, 2, 3. Well, if I do 2, 1, I get negative of that. So 2, 1, 3, well, that ends up over here. So this is probably kind of hinting at that this is very related to cross products. So we can start writing cross products out in index notation using this tensor. And what we would find when we do this is that E i cross E j is equal to this expression here. And then using these properties that I wrote down, this would also be equal to any of these expressions. Sorry, I keep going back between the way I do my epsilons. I don't know which way is more clear, probably this, I imagine. 
So now let's do that thing where we take the vectors. I did the dot product with two vectors and I wrote them out with the component and the basis vector instead of just by components. So if we did that again, if we had u cross v, then what we would end up with is ui ei cross vj ej. Remember, we use a different index because we have dummy notation on both of those vectors, so I switch from i to j just to stick with that convention. So now this would be equal to ui vj ei ej. But we know right here that this component is equal to the permutation tensor times the kth component, the kth basis vector, which means that u cross v can be written like this. So now we could write all of our cross products in this way. And we just use the properties of this. So this is going to be equal to, component-wise, this is going to be equal to, if u cross v were equal to, say, a vector w, this would be equal to w k. So this is the component equivalent of that once I take the basis vector out. So if we cross uh, u and v, then we're going to get something perpendicular to them. And this is how we would calculate the components of this vector w. And then there's one other really important property of this that you guys will probably need to use on your homework, I imagine. And we're going to see it all the time in this class, so we're going to start getting comfortable with it very soon. And this is this link between the permutation tensor and the Kronecker delta. It's called, I don't know, the epsilon delta identity. And it's this. I went back to this form, I guess. That's an L. So, if I have this, uh, this expression where I have these two permutation tensors and I'm summing on that index K, this is going to be equivalent to this expression. And this is extremely important. We're going to see this quite often throughout the course, I think. So you can do all sorts of man manipulations using these identities. And the way that you can remember this, so it's kind of long on the board right now, but there's a really easy way to remember it. And it's just that the first term here on the right side, it was constructed by if you can just kind of remember this, um, you go I to L, J to M, so we get that term. And then on the other term, which you subtract, instead of I to L, J to M, I went I to M, J to L. So you just kind of reverse, which I kind of think about it as these guys are connected by those wires, which is why I drew them, I guess. That's just kind of how you remember it. If you can remember that the first term is here, and then the second term is these two. Then eventually you won't need to look for a book to look this up. You could just remember this once you use it enough. All right, so the next things I want to talk about, now that we have an idea of how to use these guys, is how we manipulate things, algebraic expressions using the summation convention. Because when we do algebra, we're constantly doing one of these things, especially well, the first three, contraction is going to be new to us. We're either doing substitution, uh, we have some expression that is equivalent to say a variable, and then we plug that whole expression in for the variable, or we have multiplication, or we're factoring something out. So let's see what that, just a couple of examples of what this actually looks like an index notation. So 
For substitution, let's have this example. So I'll let the components of this vector x be given by this expression. So our dummy index is j, the free index is i. But if y itself is given by this expression, then what do we do when we go to plug this in? What's the first problem going to be? Repeated indices. Right, because I've written y out with this component i. So I'm going to need to rename my components. Uh, right here, I have this written out with the index j as the label. So if I write j in this expression, well then the problem I have is that I already have a j because that's the dummy index. So I'm going to need to rename it as well. So I just kind of go down the order in the alphabet. So I'm going to go with yj, but I'm going to change j to k, just bump it one down the line. So now if I wrote this expression, I could have t, i, j, and then if I plug in this expression for y, then I would end up with q, j, k, z, k. So now we have two dummy indices, two sets. We're summing on j and we're summing on k. And all I had to do to get here, I just had to be aware that if I tried to plug that initial expression in, that I would violate our principle that we can only have uh, two dummy indices per term. So I renamed them, and here I get, there's no limit on how many, dummy, how many summations we can actually do. We just need to make sure that every summation has a unique pair of indices. Now, multiplication. So this would go right to that example, um, almost to that example that I showed you. Uh, it's similar to the dot product. If I had z, which is a scalar, and that's equal to xi, yi, um, and then if I have r, another scalar, and that's equal to si, ti, and I want to look at the product of zr, it's the same problem, right? If I write all these out, I'm going to have four i's. I'm only supposed to have two. So what we would do with this, again, is we would go from, we would just pick one of them. It doesn't matter which we pick. We can pick the z term to rename everything j. We can name it r. We can name it s, u, whatever we want. Uh, but I'm just going to do this. We would write this x, y, uh, x, i, y sub i, s sub j, t sub j. So that's starting to look a little bit messy. And again, we just do that because we can't have more than two i's in here or two j's. So now factoring. We're going to see this pretty soon. Uh, this is pretty much pulled straight out of an eigenvalue problem, if you guys are familiar with those or have any memory of doing eigenvalue problems at some point. So suppose I had an expression like this now, where I have tij nj minus some constant I'll call lambda because it's pulled from an eigenvalue, ni is equal to zero. So what I have here, if we think about this, let's not get bogged down by this new thing, uh, this, you know, this notation and forget what we're actually looking at. What we're actually looking at, if it has one index, it's a component of a vector, first order tensor. So that right term where I have lambda some constant times ni, well, I have a constant times a vector, so I have a vector here. If I'm going to do subtraction, the other term better be a vector as well. And it is because we're going to end up summing on that j component. So we're going to get rid of that term, which we'll see in a second on contraction. So we have these two vectors. Now, this expression almost looks like we could just factor it out. That's what we'd really want to do if we wrote this out in vector format. We'd try to pull in out. It's the same normal vector in this case. Uh, but we can't pull it out because we have nj and ni, and we can't just rename it arbitrarily and pull it out because what's going to happen then, if I did that, say, if I just pull this nj out, so I rename it, ni now is now nj, I pull it out, so I would have tij minus this equals zero. Well, this is obviously wrong because tij is a second order tensor and lambda is a scalar value, so I can't just subtract them. That doesn't make sense. We'll learn more about that right now, but it's, think about that like a matrix. Uh, I can't just subtract this value from the whole matrix in this form. So what we actually have to do 
is use our new friend, the Kronecker delta. We can just replace that because we do know that uh, nj is equal to ni delta ij. So that's all right because I said that we can use the Kronecker delta to replace the name of an index. It's just like multiplying by the identity, basically. So if I plug that expression in now, then I would have tij nj minus lambda. Um, oops, I did this wrong. Ni, sorry, should be nj Kronecker delta ij. Same thing. I can replace whatever indice, but for this example, for this purpose, if I want to factor that out, I better write it this way. So now this will be nj delta ij equals zero. And now I do have two n sub j's, so I can just pull that out. And I would have t uh, ij minus lambda. And this is totally fine. Because we can definitely just multiply a scalar value times a tensor. Uh, it's a linear operator, so that flies. If you thought about that as just a, a matrix of components, you can multiply the whole matrix by a scalar value. So that's a nice example of when we would factorize and how we would do this. So we we're going to factor everything out. Now contraction. I, keep, I kept using the word contraction today, probably because I was writing the notes for this and kept thinking about it myself that way. We haven't talked about it yet, but all it is is summation over an index of a tensor. So when we did the dot product, and we had something like this, and we ended up with just a scalar. That is a form of contraction because we're summing on an index of a tensor and a vector is a tensor. Um, this term up here, I'm summing on j, which is an index of these tensors. So that's a form of contraction right there. And then another thing that you might be familiar with, the trace. I think that's the example I wrote down. Um, the trace of a matrix. So if we have this thing Tij and I want to just contract on Tij, I would do that just by looking at this expression. So I do a sum on those components. So this would actually be T11 plus T22 plus T33. And if this, you know, if I wrote this thing out like this form, which I can do, I can represent that as a matrix, uh, a matrix of components. So if I just contract on that one object itself, which I'm totally allowed to do because all it is is summing on the indices of a tensor. It can be multiple tensors. You can sum them together or you can sum on yourself. Uh, if I can do that, well, that's the trace, which the trace is just the sum of the diagonal components. So we'll see that quite a bit when we uh, start talking about the stress tensors in more depth. So this brings us to where we want to be with some vector algebra. Uh, I just have this you know, 2D thing. We have this vector in space. We've talked about how we represent it by this expression. Uh, we've seen that this could also be written as a sum, but if we're going to use summation and uh, notation, we can just write the components out. We can write the vector out this way. So uh, th there's a couple operations in vector algebra that we do all the time. So we do these vector sums. Uh, we have scalar multiplication. So that might just be something like this. A uh, scalar sum would be something of the form this. Uh, we have the dot products, and we have the cross products. <clears throat> so the interesting thing about these is that if we do a vector sum, if we add two vectors, we get another vector. So it results in a rank one tensor. If we do scalar multiplication, we're just doing scalar times a vector. We still result in a rank one tensor. And with a dot product, we end up with a scalar. So we have a zero order tensor. And then the cross product, uh, the cross product produces another vector. So that's a rank one vector. So I just want to go through some special properties that make up a vector space formally. Uh, again, the vector sum might be something like this, which we have seen uh, equivalently. We can just talk about this component-wise using the summation. Um, we don't have to sum, though. We can just do components using the same notation. So I can just talk about this component-wise. 
So these are all free index or free indices, right? I is the free index. I have two terms on the left hand side. I have one index in each of those terms. It's I on the right hand side. I still have I. So really I have three equations for all three components if we're in three space. So some important properties um, of summation is one, x plus y is equal to y plus x if all of these are vectors. That's called commutivity. Uh, we have x plus y plus z would be equal to x plus y plus z. That's associativity. And then we have these properties that we know that x plus negative x is equal to zero. So we can have a zero vector. That's okay. And this is called an additive inverse. And then we can also add the zero vector to a vector. And we should get x. And this is an additive identity. So going on to scalar multiplication, a nice example of this might just be something like this expression where here, yes? Sorry to go backwards. Could you get back one slide? Uh, yeah. Vector sum, does that make any sense? Just adding vectors. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. I just was talking too quickly. Thanks for pointing that out. Thank you very much. All right, so scalar multiplication, we have this example. If we write this in index notation, then we would have zi equals alpha xi. Um, or, so this is the, I should do this. This is the equivalent way to represent this expression, just speaking of components. If you wanted to actually represent the vector itself, you would say that this is equal to alpha xi so we'd have to include the basis vector. Otherwise, when we talk about the components, what we really mean is a component with respect to a certain frame. So this way you get to include the basis vector. Uh, but there's a lot of properties for this one that are important. There is so if alpha and beta are our scalar values then this expression has to hold. And if alpha and beta again are scalar values, if we add them, then this should be equal to this expression. Um, this should also hold for vector addition. So if we have two vectors and we multiply their sum times some scalar, then we should get this expression here. And then there should be some identity, some multiplicative identity. So this might just be, uh, it would be 1 times that vector is equal to that vector. And the reason I bothered to go through this uh, rigorously, any set of objects, any set of vectors that has all of those properties, in addition to properties um, one and six, so if you have two vectors and you add them, and that vector itself is also in your set of vectors, or if you multiply a vector in that set by just a multiple, a scalar multiple, then that vector, the new vector that's essentially just scaled, it's either, uh, you know, you lengthen it by uh, scaling it by something greater than one, or you shrink it. Um, if that's in the set, then you have a vector space. So. That's mostly everything we've ever dealt with in physics and engineering. It's coming out of a vector space. So anything, and again, any set with all these properties. So if we have R3, which is given here. So if we pull from the set of R3, we can have, um, that would be the set of vectors that have values, those scalar values that give you your components. Anything in the real number line from negative infinity to infinity uh, with a basis set three-dimensional. Any vector you can make out of that will have all of these properties, so that's just something to be aware of. It'll help us as we transition into more of this tensor analysis stuff. Some special operators that we're all familiar with, uh, the dot product, 
So we've done this to death right now. Um, and we saw again that we can write this out as xi yj delta ij. So the dot product itself has a bunch of properties that we just need to review. I'm going to write them out here for you so you have a nice place to go. So if they end up on your homework, you have somewhere to reference all these properties that you can use. So you might remember this property. So this would be if we have some vector x and y. This is a way that we can calculate the angle between the two vectors. Uh, x dot y is equal to y dot x. x dot, this expression where alpha and beta are going to be scalars. And y and z are vectors. And then there's some special things we can say about dot products because of this relationship. So if x dot x, which would be the magnitude of some vector uh, squared, if that's equal to 0, this can only happen if and only if the vector is equal to 0 vector. Uh, if the dot product of x itself is greater than 0, this means that x is not 0. And if the magnitude of that vector, or sorry, not if, just the magnitude of the vector is also given by this expression. And then finally, if we have x and y, we take the dot product. Uh, if this is equal to 0, this implies that x and y are perpendicular. So this would fall out immediately from this relationship. So if this expression is equal to 0, well, cosine theta is equal to 0 at pi halves or 3 pi halves which would put x and y, the angle between them, as being perpendicular. Uh, the cross product is the next special thing we need to get through today. We're all familiar with this, I hope. So if z is equal to x cross y, I showed you that in component form, we could write this as... with this nice expression. Um, and then the way that I always calculate cross products, which is probably the way you do it, you can calculate the cross product by taking the determinant of this matrix where you put the components of the vectors in. So if you need to review this, you know how to do this operation, You'll probably get an opportunity in your next homework, I imagine, or the one after that. Um, the important thing here is the right-hand rule. We refer to right-hand coordinate frames all the time in physics and engineering. And just as a reminder of what that means, if you think of your pointer finger as this vector x and your middle finger in this orientation as y, if you take the cross product of x and y, the resulting vector is perpendicular and it's pointed up. So if we reverse this orientation and we did y and x, then I would have to flip my hand upside down and you would know which direction you're pointing. And this helps out a lot because we're going to spend a lot of time talking about planes through a body, especially with stress. And we want to have outward normal, so we kind of want to be able to figure out which direction's outward and which direction's inward. Of course, just like everything else we've talked about today, there's quite a few properties that come along with this. First of all, if we have two vectors, their cross product is equal to the negative of that cross product if we just reverse the order of the cross product. And that goes right back to that right-hand rule. Um, if u cross v is equal to 0, that means that u and v are proportional to each other, and they're in the same direction. So 
We can't have something normal to two vectors if they're just in the same vector. You need two vectors for that, so if they're in the same direction, we can't possibly carry out this operation, so we end up with zero. Um, again, if alpha is a scalar, so we have alpha times this vector, and we cross that with v, this is going to be equivalent to u cross alpha times v, which is also going to be equivalent to alpha times the cross product of u and v. And then we also have that u cross the vectors v plus w, that's going to be equal to u cross v plus u cross w. And then finally, um, kind of equivalent to that term where we had u dot v is equal to the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v equal to the cosine of the angle between them, we have a similar expression where the magnitude of u cross v is equal to the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times the sine of the angle between them. I think I had this picture. Nope, I guess I didn't make it onto the chart today. Um, another nice thing is the magnitude. So if we have this, and I have y, and I have z here, or x and z, this parallelogram here that you could trace out, if you added these two together, you get this parallelogram. The area here is equal to, uh, I should call this V actually, U. The magnitude of U cross V will give you that area. Another nice thing, if we look at this whole volume, so we have this parallel piped situation here, the volume for that guy is going to be given by the expression Z dot x cross y in this picture. So that brings us to the final special property we'll talk about. Uh, so we've had special properties for the dot product and the vector product and then there's a couple, there's one important thing you can do when you mix those together. So if I have a vector x, y, and then I have some vector z here. If I dot x with the vector that results from y cross z, this expression will be equal to taking the determinant of this vector. And some properties for this, x cross y dot with z, that's equal to y cross x, or sorry, y cross z. Dotted with x, and this is also equal to z cross y, or x dotted with y. So there's some kind of permutation going on in those expressions. Also, z dot x cross y is going to be equal to negative of z dotted with y cross x. And that instantly just falls out because y cross x is equal to the negative of x cross y. So you have a negative 1 scalar multiplied times that expression, and we can pull it out from the algebraic properties. And then finally, we have this, this expression that if we have a vector dotted with the cross product of two other vectors. So first of all, this would be a scalar because the cross product gives us a vector. We're dotting it with another vector. We're going to have a scalar. So if we multiply that scalar times the vector x, this expression can also be given by x cross y cross x cross z. And I would expect that you're going to have to derive some expressions for these in summation convention. So you're going to have to use that notation to show that all these guys are true. And that wraps up class today. I think we'll do an actual example that's useful.
going to be very useful for stress tensors at the start of class on Wednesday, I guess. Yeah, it's Labor Day weekend. So everybody have a really good weekend.